Hello, Internet, and welcome to another episode of That's All I Have to Say About That, Supreme Court Saturday. As always, I'm your host, Stephen Mackey. Today we're talking about the Supreme Court history of loyalty oaths, something Trump relies on like it's a Russian bank. Now, the U.S. is no stranger for making people pledge allegiance to everything from the flag of the United States of America and even to the NRA, although back in the 1940s, that was the National Recovery Agency. In fact, during the Civil War, prisoners were often released after taking an oath of allegiance. As you can imagine, this has not exactly been supported by the Constitution, though, as being forced to believe in certain things and not speak in certain otherwise legal manners kind of goes against most of our basic principles. With that said, let's look into the Supreme Court's history of interpreting loyalty oaths. So let's start with the Ironclad Oath. A time just after the Civil War, when the North had the unambiguous moral high ground, and quickly tried to figure out how to change that. The basic idea to this oath was that anyone who wanted to vote or run for office had to swear that they had never voluntarily borne arms against the United States, had voluntarily given no aid, countenance, or counsel to encouragement to the persons in a rebellion, and had exercised or attempted to exercise the functions of no office under the Confederacy. This was clearly not received well, as it was pretty much only allowed for blacks to run for office and vote. Which probably has you scratching your head right now, because if you've ever even looked at the cover of a history book, you'll know that African Americans weren't exactly the political elite in the Southern Reconstruction Era. The oath was applied to Southern voters in 1864, and in 1867, the United States Supreme Court held that the federal ironclad oath for attorneys and similar Missouri state oaths for ministers, teachers, and other professionals was unconstitutional because they violated the constitutional prohibition specifically that you can't declare a person or a group of persons guilty of some crime and punish them, often without a trial, specifically targeting their civil rights. An ironic defense for the Confederacy and the KKK, but hey, it worked. This meant that Confederate sympathizers could again run for local office and eventually in 2017 become President of the United States. Now this brings us to 1949, a time when the belief in economic and social equality was deemed the biggest threat to American society. Wow, our nations really took a dip in quality between Nazis and ISIS. Now clearly this fear would lead to people to be untrusting of labor unions, which leads us to American Communications Association vs. Dowds. In 1947, despite President Truman's veto, the Taft-Hartley Act was passed by Congress which in part required leaders of labor unions to file an affidavit with the National Labor Regulations Board affirming that they were not members of the Communist Party USA and did not advocate the violent overthrow of the United States federal government. And if a union elected the leader who did not file such an affidavit, that union would lose the protection of the National Labor Relations Act. First off, you gotta love the logic of the American government. These Soviets are godless, spineless people bent on taking down the American government. But I'm sure they won't lie on this government document. The American Communications Association refused to sign off on the anti-communist affidavits claiming it violated their First Amendment rights. And not because they were communist saboteurs who had nearly been foiled by a piece of paperwork. Unfortunately, because of their unwillingness to fill out the affidavit, the union was barred from attending the NLRB supervised union organizing election, which led them to sue claiming their First Amendment rights were being violated. Now something weird happened in this case though, because three of the court's most liberal judges didn't reside on the case. Justice William O. Douglas was recovering from a horseback riding accident that nearly killed him, because what do you expect when you strap a 51-year-old constitutional geek to a horse? In fact, four months after he rejoined the courts, he was re-hospitalized after a different course kicked him in the head. Man, it's the mid-20th century and cars exist. Clearly this hobby is not for you. Anyways, a stark civil rights advocate, Justice Wiley Blount Rutledge, died of a stroke just before this court case. And Justice Tom Clark re recused himself from the case because of his previous dealings with the American Communications Association. 
This left the court with a hard decision to make. Did the language in the law target the Communist Party or anyone who wanted to violently take down the American government? And more importantly, did any of this matter? Turns out it mattered a lot, because if you're going to take down the government, you better not want equality. With Justice Vinson saying, insofar as a distinction between beliefs and political affiliations is based upon absence of any overt act, the act of joining the party is crucial and the defendants lost the case. Now if you're confused, don't worry, this will get cleared up in the next few cases. And this brings us to 1951's Garner v. Board of Public Works. You see, back in 1941, the California State Legislature amended the Charter of the City of Los Angeles so that no person could obtain or retain public employment with the city if they had advocated the violent overthrow of either the state or federal government, belonged to any organization that did so advocate, or had advocated or been a member of an organization which advocated such action in the last five years. And wow, right off the bat, that would be like applying for a job at a bank and refusing to promise that you hadn't tried to violently destroy that bank or worked with people who had tried to do just that. But we all know what type of people this was trying to prohibit. Just don't be a communist. That said, 15 LA Civic employees did just that and were summarily fired, resulting in them suing the local government, claiming that the oath and the affidavit they were required to execute constituted a bill of attendere and an ex post facto law, which, if you remember from the beginning, was the same argument that got the Confederacy their rights back. Although it didn't work out as well for the communists, because at the end of the day, which one is more dangerous, a second nation that rose up to fight us, or a handful of civic employees who believe in nationalization? The question here was really about whether this oath required the prior knowledge of the activities of an organization a person belongs to, as well as the five-year deadline for violence against the government. This was deemed valid because it was assumed that anyone who didn't know that their party had advocated against the government wouldn't be fine taking the oath, and the fact that the law had a five-year statute of limitations meant that it wasn't violating a person's right to change their behavior and be redeemed. This brings us to the 1952 case of Wyman v. Updegraff. In 1950, Oklahoma enacted legislation requiring all state officers and employees to take an oath pledging loyalty to the United States of America affirming that they did not advocate the violent overthrow of the U.S. government and denying direct or indirect action with a communist-affiliated party. Eh, at this point, you know the drill. Although, this was Oklahoma in the 1950s, so you couldn't America harder if you ate a Big Mac while on a bald eagle while bombing a small oil-rich country. After 30 days, some people continued to refuse to take the oath, so a citizen sued Oklahoma to get the state to stop paying them. Now this case had a few critical differences between the case we just discussed. First, because there was an assumption that if you were a member of a party, you were expected to know everything your party is doing. Which is clearly not true, since I'm not even sure our current president really knows what he believes in. The other big difference is that, unlike the previous loyalty oaths, this oath didn't give you the opportunity to renounce your old parties and regain privileges after a certain waiting period. which got it voted unconstitutional. Now to 1958 and Spicer versus Randall. Where again, the state of California, for whatever reason, was scared of a violent overthrow of the government. And you thought the government was paranoid now. Basically, as a requirement for veterans to receive special property tax breaks, they had to sign a loyalty oath saying that they didn't advocate for a violent or unlawful overthrow of the US government nor would they advocate for a foreign government if there was an act of war. Yada yada yada, we've all heard it quite a few times at this point. A World War II veteran refused to sign the oath, but he fought against it arguing that it violated the 14th Amendment or due process, rather than the First Amendment. Essentially, he was arguing for people to have the right to violently overthrow the government until the government has finished an investigation into the issue. This meant that the question the Supreme Court had to answer here was, had California chosen a fair method to determine whether a tax exemption claimant is in fact someone who the criminal act specified applies? Interestingly enough, 
The court ruled that the burden of proof rests with the states and not the individual, so it's unconstitutional to ask citizens if they want to violently overthrow the government. Now here's my personal favorite case of the night, 1973's Communist Party of Indiana vs. Whitcomb. Yes, apparently there's a liberal somewhere in Indiana. In 1972, Indiana passed a law that every party had to take a loyalty oath saying that they weren't going to advocate the overthrow of a local, state, or national government through violence or force. And the Communist Party of Indiana said, I'm sorry, we can't make any promises. This led to Indiana refusing to put them on the ballot and the Communist Party of Indiana suing the state and the Supreme Court for their right to violently overthrow the government. The Supreme Court voted unilaterally in support of the Communist Party of Indiana, saying, A group advocating violent overthrow as an abstract doctrine need not be regarded as necessarily advocating unlawful action. Basically, you guys are all talking no action, so carry on. Well, that's how we got to the modern legal standing regarding loyalty oaths. So remember, if Uncle Sam asks you to promise not to violently overthrow the country, you can tell him to shut the heck up. But please don't overthrow us. I'd have to quit talking altogether if it became illegal to mock the government. Thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Join us next Supreme Court Saturday when we're talking about confessions, specifically when they're coerced or come from unmirandized people.